I'm Whitney Tilson. I hope you enjoy this video. If you'd like to learn more about case learning and our programs, just go to caselearning.com. And if you have any questions, just email me at info at caselearning.com. All right, um, thanks for the really kind words, Whitney. And thank you guys for being here. This is a phenomenal conference. And uh, I think I'm low key in love with Gabriel right now. That was just a, probably the best talk I've ever heard. Uh, so I'm, my talk today is called My Big Fatty Reefer Vetting. And oh, the big green button. All right. Um, here's our disclaimer. All of the slide titles today are going to be uh, from Jonathan Green's Dictionary of Slang. So if you're curious what any of them mean, uh, feel free to look up online after the talk. All right, so first a brief follow-up uh, from our last talk. Uh, this is the magic underwear guy from our talk in May. And uh, he's had a really rough go of it. Uh, this is the magic underwear guy now. So by the way, I thought I was going to be the last talk before lunch, before they switch things around. So um, hopefully you guys will be at it. I tried to entertain you today. I figured you'd be falling asleep, ready to eat. All right, uh, and just since we talked last time, it's down a lot. All right, uh, just briefly, one thing I wanted to say about my fund. I think one thing we do really well is we have maybe like 15 or 20 different parlor tricks of things that work. Um, some of those things are from academia, and some of those are things that we've derived in-house. Um, in the talk today, I'm going to touch on kind of you know two or three similar things that I think are kind of generalizable and hopefully will help you guys um, in all of your shorting. All right, uh, one of my favorite Buffett quotes, you don't need to be a rocket scientist. Investing is not a game uh, where the guy with the 160 IQ beats the guy with the 130 IQ. Um, and even if you do have an IQ of 160, just give away 30 points to someone else because you don't need it. Um, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about health insurance innovations, which is HIQ, and I almost presented it to you today. Um, but it's one of those shorts where you, you know, it's a really intellectually stimulating short, but I don't know if it's necessarily as good of a short as the short that I'm giving you today. Um, sometimes the best trades are really the ones that you know, take five minutes to learn about and 30 seconds to think about. So I mean, in intuition is really valuable in this business. All right, so there's a little audience participation opportunity, and I have a, a, some prizes um, for, for you who participate. So there's four US listed companies that have a market cap of at least $5 billion, um, but have 2019 revenue estimates of $250 million or less. So uh, if you can name one of the four, I have a prize for you. All right, you said Tilray? Good. Well done. All right, anyone else? Uh, sorry, no. Anyone? Or, no, uh, the other three are all biotechs. Oh, who said Al Nylum? Great job. All right, anyone else? No. All right, um, also Sage and Bluebird. So Tilray, obviously, is going to be this, the company we're talking about today. All right, so Tilray wants to be all things cannabis globally. Um, they want to kind of grow cannabis and distribute cannabis and resell cannabis and process cannabis. Um, kind of a focus on uh, medical cannabis, um, but also some recreational as well. All right, so this is uh, Tilray's historical financials, and then the light shade is the estimates for the next two quarters. Um, 10 million in trailing revenue last quarter, Gross profit of $3 million, operating income of negative uh, $20 million. You know, Canadian marijuana legalization just, uh, just happened October 17th, so obviously they're going to have a tailwind from that. Um, what you've seen, though, as states legalize marijuana is basically the, the total amount, you know, the, the total marijuana industry really grows by about 100% over three to five years, so it's not. Um, it's not this magic thing where all of a sudden, like, everyone's smoking marijuana now. All right. The most impressive thing about Tilray is its stock performance. Um, so from the time it came public, uh, in, in its first 44 trading days, it was up more than 1,100%. Uh, and one really important thing to note on this chart is um, the float's only 10.3 million shares, so for a lot of this run, it was literally turning over more than its entire float every single day. Um, for, for names, I mean, this happened like kind of in the backdrop of a lot of people in Canada and also the US like opening brokerage accounts just specifically so that they could trade marijuana stocks. Um, 
And one of the things that we look at when we're trying to sort um, retail-driven um, kind of bubble stocks is how much dollar volume is this thing actually turning over every day? And I would say like five years ago, we had an internal rule of thumb that like, oh, this thing's gotten to $40 million of average daily volume, so it's probably ripe to short right now. Um, and then gradually, as the bull market's gone on, that, that metric's gone from, oh, $100 million of average daily volume to $200 million. And you can see, I mean, this thing just went absolutely insane. By the end of this run, it had a $7 billion uh, volume day. All right, so this is really a perfect blow off top on the daily chart. So um, first, you know, here's a very nice exponential trend line and the price blows past that. So this is not just a parabola, this is something that the, at the end was going up even faster than parabolic. Um, obviously you have record volume three times the float on that blow off day. Um, and one thing we don't show on this chart, but was really apparent if you were involved in Tilray that day, is uh, very discon discontinuous um, trading action intraday. So there were several halts on the upside and the downside. All right, um, unlike Energist last time, this big price move was actually a short squeeze. Uh, you had spot lending rates for all of November, basically more expensive than NEG 100. And then the day of the blow off top, you actually had NEG, NEG 600 uh, spot lending rates for anyone who could get stock. Um, and obviously in that kind of environment, there were a lot of recalls um, as well. All right, um, so our basic hypothesis here, and I guess one of the things that got me, um, one of the first useful insights I had as an investor in the late 90s was from uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy's dad, James. Um, his book on quant factors was um, really helpful for me, and I guess the two things that came out of that book were particularly helpful was the value of 52-week momentum and the value of price to sales or enterprise value to sales. Um, so obviously his son, Patrick, has continued in his footsteps and um, did this really nice analysis, which is online free for anyone to look at, um, looking at, um, looking at this, this is sales to enterprise value, so kind of the inverse ratio. Um, what you see is that if you're among the cheapest stocks on an EV to sales basis, and the same holds for price to sales as well, um, that you have a good return, and if you're in the, the worst decile uh, for price to sales, if you're very expensive relative to your sales, um, over the last four decades or so, you're lagging by about 700 basis points um, a year. So it's a, it's a really powerful quant factor. Um, I wanted to take that one step further and say, um, what if we look at not just the most expensive decile, but the really, really, really super expensive stocks? How's that go? All right, so let's look at every stock with trailing revenue of less than $100 million, market cap above $5 million uh, that's US listed. And just one quick note, when you construct a screen like this, you'll note like Tilray's trailing revenue is $32.5 million, and its market cap is $9.5 billion. If you say, I'm gonna set my cutoffs at like $32.5 million and $9.5 billion, you're really missing half the data in the set. So it's really important, if you do a screen like this to um, to, to kind of at least double the metrics that you're looking for. All right, so we excluded biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, and the reason we did that is if you've got a really phenomenal asset in phase two or phase three, um, obviously you might have no revenue from that asset, and then it could be you know, a multi-billion dollar drug with a 15-year you know, patent life. Okay, and then after we did the screen, we realized that we also needed to exclude financials, holding companies, and thin OTC names, obviously. So you can be a really big financial company and have negative revenue in a year. Um, you can be a hold co that has underlying assets that have a lot of revenue themselves, um, but obviously your reported revenue might be zero if you don't consolidate them. All right, so this is, <laughs> this is one of those graphs in every presentation that you can't actually see the text of. Um, but hopefully you can see the colors on this graph and there's a lot more red than green. Um, so what you're looking at is six month, one year, two year, three year, and five year performance from the time that a company entered our screen um, going forward. Uh, at one year, the mean performance was negative 37%. Two years, it was negative 76%. And by five years, it was negative 89%. Um, one year in, only 12 of the 41 stocks was a winner. By two years, that dropped to four out of 41, and by five years, that dropped to one out of 41. All right, so let's look at what made stocks higher at one year. Um, 
the tech bubble made stocks higher at one year. If, if you had been unlucky and aggressively short early in the tech bubble, um, you would have watched at-home network potentially go up 248% um, over one year after you shorted it. Um, so most of the stocks in 98 and 99 actually had positive one-year performance, uh, but then all of them were down at least 75% by year three from where they started. Um, the other kind of stocks that actually did okay at one year were stocks that had a very large asset base. So for example, um, XM Satellite and Sirius, obviously, which later merged, um, had, um, had okay one-year performance, although disastrous five-year performance. And then Cobalt, which is an energy ENP, had a really great one-year performance before completely falling apart. All right, only one stock was higher at uh, five years. Anyone with good eyes or uh, really, yep, nice job, heads up. <laughs> All right, so Wynn Resorts had 3.4 billion of assets. It really wasn't that expensive, 3.4 times tangible book. You wouldn't have wanted the short. It was up 185% uh, at year three. All right, um, what chart is this? Come on, guys. Anyone? Thank you. Who's where? Oh my gosh, you're gonna be so high tonight. Um, all right. So, yes, yeah, so this is the Nasdaq. This is my favorite top. This is what top should look like. Um, you've got you've got the blow off top, and then you've got this retest where it comes back and it tries to go higher and it, and it, it fails, and then it comes back and it fails at exactly the same level. Like, what a great entry point to short something if you're looking to, to you know to get short a bubble, and then. The sell-off is super well organized on the way down. It's, you know, it's, it's fantastic. All right. Um, anyone recognize this chart? Anyone but you? Not you? No? No takers? All right. This is gold. Um, another good bubble. This, this is a little bit different, but again, you have you know, the attempt at a retest. It fails. You fail again at the same level. If you had shorted there, again, you'd have done okay. There's a really nice solid downtrend line, and if you just covered when that got broken, you'd have been okay. And then when it finally breaks, again, really nice. And this is on a log chart. It's a really nice brisk sell-off. Um, great entry point. All right. So here is our Tilray. Uh, this is the daily. So you've got you know, you've got the failed retest coming back to exactly the same level, and then you've got um, really nice respect for the log trend line on the way down. I think this is a phenomenal entry point for Tilray. Um, the other thing that's really impressive about that, note the stock is not up recently. Meanwhile, here's what's been happening to the lending rate. So um, in the second half of November, the bar on Tilray was um, above neg 500 for spot rates. And the stock still couldn't rally on that. So if a stock is that tight and can't rally, it's not going to rally. All right, here's a couple other factors that I think you have going for you if you, um, if you short Tilray at this point. So uh, Tilray's IPO lockup expires January 15th. From the academic literature, we know that um, stocks that have large residual VC interests tend to have larger than, uh, you know, larger than usual negative returns in the period um, before IPO lockup expiry. And we also know that firms that have the strongest IPO to lockup expiry performance also tend to suffer greater abnormal returns around lockup expiry. So in Tilray's case, they have both of these going for them, and the lockup expires January 15th. Um, all right, I'm not going to make much of a fundamental case against this company. I think it's, it's on the longs to explain why this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But basically, this is definitely a commodity business. Growing marijuana, reselling marijuana, extracting marijuana is all very commodity. Yes, you can point to niche markets within marijuana that are not commodity, but the big picture here is price comes down over time and it comes down aggressively. Um, all right, so these are strawberries in Iceland. Why am I showing you Icelandic strawberries? Okay, these are the most delicious strawberries that I've ever eaten in my life. All right, do you get your strawberries from Iceland? No, all right, because they're $15 a pound, all right. They grow in a warehouse. Why? Because it's really cold most of the year in Iceland, and the sun comes in at like a low angle like this, and there's not that much of it. Um, guess what? That's Canada also, right? So um, I grew up in Kentucky, OK? Kentucky, California, Mexico, Central America, there are a million places to grow marijuana that are better and more cost effective than a greenhouse in Canada. All right. I'd say the biggest risk to our short thesis is someone making another brutally stupid $4 billion investment. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure why Constellation did this. Um, hopefully, it doesn't happen again. I think by this point, people are less excited about the space, and hopefully, have figured out, um, you know, that that's not a good allocation of four billion dollars. All right. Any questions?
Thank you, Chris. Um, I love the technical. Uh, I think you're the first person at any of my conferences to ever talk about the technicals, but it makes, it makes sense. I'm a believer. It is a great entry point. Um, um, questions? Yeah. I think on certain prime brokers, they borrow is still in like the 100 to 80 percent range. Do you think it's still worth it at, at this point, or wait till closer to the lockout? Yeah, actually, so we, um, we have a little options position on, and we're also still short outright. And I think even, even at neg 80, I, I like it here, because I, th I think you're going to have some very brisk deterioration. Um, I would expect it to be trading, and this is just a guess, but I, you know, my base case is probably around 60, around the time of lockup. Um, and I think it continues to drop from there. Um, obviously, if you look at the options, there's a good bit of skew where the puts are more expensive than the calls, as you'd expect for something that's super hard to borrow. Um, you know, this is, this is not investment advice, um, but I think if, if I were looking to put the structure on from scratch today, I think one thing I would look at is potentially um, going out to January and buying the 100 uh, put and maybe selling a 100 call against it in January, or you could do the 90 strike as well. I believe this deal was underwritten by Cohen, right? Do you think there'd be a possibility that they don't break the uh, lockup? Um, you know, that, I mean, that's always a possibility. I, I think one other thing, as I've heard, and I'm almost tempted not to say it, but, but there's been some, some talk of some pressure um, on Cowan to specifically not allow borrows on the name uh, or potentially some shenanigans, in the, and that's, that's just total rumor and speculation. So please, you know, that's not a serious allegation, but um, that, that rumor is definitely out there. Yeah. Up front here, um, microphone. Um, I'm just trying to get into the, your head as a, as a PM. So um, this idea of Tilray being overvalued, you know, what's true at 60, 70, 80, all the way to 300. So uh, at what point did you enter the trade? Um, what was the trigger for you on the way down that made you feel comfortable getting into it? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, so I'm not a genius um, at, at trading Tilray. We actually took a lot of pain in Tilray. Um, I think... So is a model for trading any like super bubble retail driven um, short is these things can keep going and going and going and going. So um, I think the most important thing with a stock like this is to start really small. Um, so we actually shorted Tilray initially at around 40, um, covered almost of our position immediately thereafter after they had a really good earnings report and it was clear that the stock was responding well. Um, in the after hours, and we didn't want to hang around for that. Um, we took another crack at it later, but you know, frankly, we took a lot of pain on Tilray, and it really wasn't until the day of the blow-off top and the day after the blow-off top where all of a sudden there was a really great opportunity to get much larger in our trade, and that opportunity was the long-dated options volatility finally blew out to the upside. And what that meant is with the stock in the 200s, you could write long-dated calls with like a 300 or a 400 strike and really get a very significant amount of premium for them because the implied vol was just high um, for years on out. So that was, that was kind of the best part of our, our entry uh, in Tilray so far. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, I, yeah. I, so, um, I think it's always important to put your, um, you know, to, to put yourself in the shoes of what other market participants are thinking. And so, if you're a if you're a retail investor and you own this, um, better expected revenue was going to be very um, better than expected revenue was kind of the catalyst that was exciting to people. And I think they had a a, a modest revenue beat um, that quarter, and that's what made the stock react well and made us decide to to cover for them. Uh, right there in the middle of the room, uh, Jethro. Thanks for the presentation. I enjoyed it. Uh, like, I'm not sure if you, uh, you know, saw the, the first presentation that we got. It's in the same category, like, uh, uh, overly expensive. Like, I don't know if you saw the presentation. Like, what, what do you think about like, combining these two pieces and, you know, you know going for the, um, it totally makes sense for that 
all over time. But then like Atria is also like not super expensive, so like maybe uh, would you also recommend to do shop uh, well, I, I don't make recommendations, um, but I, I thought the Afria presentation is probably the best one I've ever seen, and we are presently short of Afria um, as well. <laughs> Do you, um, let me ask a related question. Do you, in your due diligence on Tilray, have you uncovered anything that leads you to believe these are shady characters, that there might be fraud, um, et cetera? Um, we have not encountered anything that, that led us to believe that they are um, and, and, and I haven't done a tremendous dive. I've, I did have one allocator tell me that he uh, felt like management was, you know, quote, like a snake oil salesman or highly promotional. But that yes. was, um, that's as far as I've gotten. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Whitney. I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, if you'd like to learn more about case learning and our programs, just go to caselearning.com. And if you have any questions, email me at info at caselearning.com. Thank you.